Thank you so much, sir, yeah. for this session. Now I would like to call Dr. Professor Nibir Ghosh, and he will be speaking on the subject today, Why Literature Matters in the Study and Practice of Law. Without further ado, I would like to pass the mic to the distinguished guest. Dr. Professor Prasant Shu, Dr. Navdeen, Dr. Tanya, Raghav Baroda, Pranit Singh, Namaha Bose, faculty members, Arju Annual, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I would like to extend my greetings on behalf of Remarkings to Professor Prasunan Chu for highlighting a very important dimension which could be of great interest to students. I greet you on behalf of Remarkings and since we are the co-host, I also thank you from the core of my heart. It was wonderful listening to you. Well, as uh, Nama said, my, what I'm supposed to be talking about is why literature matters in the study and practice of law. Friends, in a digitalized setting we are in, it is uh, somewhat eerie, you know, that you cannot see all the participants listening to you and you all uh, you almost have a feeling of uh, Orwellian big brother watching you. So I uh, extend my greetings on behalf of Remarkings to all the young participants whom who are by default big brothers watching what the others are doing. Well friends, to begin with what I am trying to share with you, I am not delivering any talk as such. I would like to share my experiences with you as a teacher, writer, scholar, editor, someone who has seen how the courts function, how the judges function, how the advocates work. I would like to begin with two quotes of W. H. Auden, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. One statement he makes in Disillusionment in 1939. He says, poetry makes nothing up. If we keep that in mind, we will say that uh, any discussion of any connectivity of literature becomes redundant. Another quote which I'm going to use is, where Auden says, you cannot tell people what to do. Because Dr. Navleen had mentioned in the inaugural, you know, that what we say is going to inspire people. So I have come with no words of inspiration as such. What Auden says is, you cannot tell people what to do. You can only tell them parables. And that is what art really is. And what is art? Particular stories of particular people and experiences from which each according to his immediate and peculiar needs may draw his own conclusions. So what I'm going to share with you is a collage of impressions. And you have to draw your own conclusions. I'm not going to move on a straight track. When we talk about uh, the RG annual or all the institutes that are catering to law, you know what, what the first thought that comes to my mind is that law itself is a very challenging profession, the legal profession, because you have the complexity, even when you look at the deity of justice, the, ju the deity of justice who was the, uh, represented as Themis in ancient Greek, she is blindfolded. Justice is blindfolded 
holding a pair of scales in one hand and a sword in the other, which ideally represents that blindness represents fairness and impartiality as well as the gift of prophecy. This is idols. And what is reality? You see an Amitabh Bachchan movie like Andha Kanum, and you have a different interpretation of the blindfolded deity of justice. I will now share a quote, and I will tell you the author after I am done with the quote. This statement says the lawyers will, as a rule, advance quarrels instead of repressing them. It is within my knowledge that they are glad when men have disputes. Petty pleaders actually manufacture them. Their touts, like so many leeches, suck the blood of the poor people. Friends, I'll now disclose the name from whom the quote comes. It is Mahatma Gandhi writing in Hind Swaraj. And you know where Gandhi is concerned. He himself said that when I was taking up the profession of law in the Bailey court, I often heard that a lawyer's profession is a liar's profession. So in, all, in the midst of all these complexities, the challenges that the profession as such offers in a free country, in a free democratic country, Justice is available to everyone, but in order to go for justice, the kind of impediments that you have to face is, you feel that it is better to go the way of Karl Marx, who said, religion is the opium of the masses. You just go and pray that may somebody who has eyes see what is going on. My first uh, <coughs> emphasis will be why literature matters. I'm not trying to advocate that all of you, you know, will transform your lives if you read literature. Nothing of that sort. <coughs> Initial, even now, I think, we are up against a wall of resistance if by choice at the, as an adolescent we start talking about we you know i love literature and i was to take up literature as a profession the chances are you may be thrown out of your house that's what you're talking about if you are not an engineer or a doctor or anything of that sort, and obviously recently, I think maybe 10 years or so, that uh, even legal profession has probably gained importance. So what I'm going to emphasize on is why literature matters. And for this, I will be taking up several parables. The first parable that I would like to share with you is a story, Hindi story, written in Hindi. The author is Sudarshan. Many of you in your schools may have read it, but I would like to share the story nevertheless. <laughs> in this story, there are two main characters. One character is called, is the saint who is known as Baba Bharti. And another character, prominent character, is a dacoit by the name of Jagat Singh. Now these two know each other. And the third character, not in human form, is a horse called Sultan. 
who belongs to the saint Baba Bharte. Baba Bharte loves this horse, who is which is exceptionally a kind of a great horse, loves the horse like his own kitten, kin and son. Now in this story, what happens? One day, this decoy learns about the greatness of Sultan, and he says that I am so powerful, nothing moves in this area without my wish. I must possess this fox. So he goes to Baba Bharti and says that I want to take this horse, I want to buy this horse. And Baba Bharti tells him that I love this horse like my little son and I can part with anything in the world, but I cannot part with Sultan. He pleads and goes away. One day, this Baba Bharti riding on Sultan is going at top speed and enjoying the beauty of nature. Now what happens? While the horse is in motion, he suddenly hears a very pathetic cry. And that pathetic cry tells him that you know, he finds that beneath a tree, there is a person who is in tatters, very poor and shabby looking, who seems to be absolutely sick and invalid, physically challenged. And he hears the other person say, Baba, Rok Chao, Mujhe Teen Meel Door Gaon Tak Jana Hai, Mujhe Le Chalo, Nahi Toh Mere Pran Yehi Khatam Ho Jayenge. Baba Bharte gets down from the horse and makes this man sit on the horse. And the moment he sits on the horse, he sees a great jerk and then he sees that that man whom he had mistaken for a poor sick person is no one else but Kharat Singh. And when he sees that it is Kharat Singh, he is a little surprised at first. I wish to share a part of that conversation that takes place between the two. So this man, he go, gets up on the horse and he is about to ride away with the horse. And this uh, he tells, and Kharat Singh is about to move when Baba Bharti says, Thodi der ke liye ruk chao. This man stops and Kharat Singh says, Ki mein ye ghoda nahi dhunga tumko. Is ghode ke lawa jo bhi maungo tumara hai. He says, ghode ki baat mein nahi kar ra. Lekin, Mary ek vinti sunte jau. And he thought maybe he has something up his sleeves and he says, ah, thik ye kaho. What Baba Bharti tells Kadak Singh is, Mary pratna keval ye hai, ki is khatna ko kisi ke saamne prakat na karna. This man, Kharat Singh, who thinks that he has to run away as fast as he can with the horse, he sees the owner is telling him that instead of uh, his reporting this matter to everyone, he says, don't mention this matter to anyone. And he focuses his full attention on Baba Bharti's face and he says, Baba Ji, is mein aapko kya dar hai? Sunkar Baba Bharti ne uttar kiya, Logon ko yedi is ghatna ka pata chale, to wo din dukhiyo par vishwas karna band kar dehenge. I'm reading a passage which follows this conversation. Baba Bharti chale gai. परंतु उनके शब्द खड़क सिंह के कानों में उसी प्रकार गूंज रहे थे सोचता था 
कैसे ऊंचे विचार हैं कैसा पवित्र भाव है उन उस उन्हें इस घोड़े से प्रेम था इसे देखकर उनका मुंह फूल की तरह खिल जाता था कहते थे इसके बिना मैं रह ना सकूंगा इसकी रखवाली में वो कई रात सोए नहीं भजन भक्ति ना कर रखवाली करते रहे परंतु आज उनके मुख पर दुख की रेखा तक दिखाई ना पड़ती उन्हें केवल ये ख्याल आया कहीं लोग दीन दुखियों पर विश्वास करना ना छोड़ दे ऐसा मनुष्य मनुष्य नहीं देखता this is i'm not taking you to the end of the story if you are interested when you read the story you will see what a powerful ending it is this is why literature matters it changes it can change the mind of a saint as well as the mind of a devotee the second parable which i wish to share with you while emphasizing the power of literature i will take you back to almost two centuries 18 the first quarter of the 18th century i wish to share with you the experience of a slave boy who was named frederick douglas Frederick Douglass is the name which even if you google you will know that it is a great story of a slave who became free this frederick douglass when he was an 8 year old boy he was with a family of owls and the wife of the couple the wife and the couple encouraged frederick douglas to take interest in reading douglas began to find a lot of joy in being encouraged by this lady sophia to read but then one day he sees that her husband comes in and says that what the hell are you doing you are teaching a nigger to read the moment he reads he will want to be free and you will lose it and this wife suddenly realizes that what her husband is saying is right and then she stops guiding him but this 8 year old boy has heard that education reading can make him free and from that moment it becomes a passion with this boy who is seeing brutality all around and then what he, you know he feels that he must write he must read he must learn to read and write and what does he do he goes out when he goes out but that though he is the with a white family all around there are a lot of uh, white families around and when he goes out to meet with the boys of his age he finds that those boys are all going to school and mostly they are talk they talk about a particular book they said oh i read this book today oh this is fantastic and then he says so this boy who is a slave boy he is uh, feels a kind of a desperate attachment to own that book and you know what he does for one month he polishes the boots of the white men so that he can save money and buy this book and you know because he was working with a family where food was in plenty so he would carry bread in his pocket he would carry some eatables in his pocket he would give to those boys who would probably in exchange tell him something teach him something and he begins to own that book and what i wish you to notice the title of the book is called 
the Colombian orator, written by Caleb Bingham in the year 1870. And you know what it says? In that book, I prefer to be true to myself, even that slave boy says that he wants to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and incur my own abhorrence. From my earliest recollection, I date the entertainment of a deep conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul empire. Another point which I want to share over here, which probably I don't want you to miss this point, that this boy is desperate to read because he has found a goal for himself, and that goal is freedom. And he knows that these words would be the bridge which would take him to the goal of freedom. And then what he does, he looks at, uh, he, he says that my copy book was the board fence brick wall, pavement, and my pen and ink was a lump of chalk. When he goes to the Colombian orator, what attracts him most is that there is a kind of a essay where there is a dialogue between a slave master and a slave. This boy reads that and he sees that there is an argument, there is a debate in this uh, kind of an essay where the slave owner tells him that you have run away thrice and I've caught you thrice. Now I, do, I, do, I want to give you and all that. And there is a debate. And ultimately at the end of the debate, the slave owner is convinced that this man deserves his freedom and he gives him his freedom. So this idea gets into him. And apart from that, I think if you, the kind of, if you read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, you will see the kind of the pieces in the Colombian orator which influenced him. And he was so influenced and you see what happened. In 1833, Frederick Douglass wins his freedom. But that is not the story, that a slave boy becomes free. He becomes one of the greatest abolitionists in there. And since those days you didn't have those WhatsApp and Facebook circulating, he would run wherever he could and wherever he saw a gathering, he would get there and he would speak in such eloquent words that people simply black and white, both of them were transfixed and they would sit and listen to him and they would just wonder that uh, is it true that you could have a genius like him who has just being freed from slavery without a teacher, without a school, without anything for that matter. Literature, as I said, that if you don't have a goal, maybe a reading literature can be just reading story. The third example I wish to share with you is of a great writer whom I had the chance to meet at Seattle during my Fulbright year in the US. And uh, when I was, and I call him a great writer because he's the winner of two Pulitzer Prizes. His name is August Wilson. And when I was actually thinking of August Wilson, I, I have read at many places that he does not grant interview to anyone. He is a kind of a recluse, stays within himself and doesn't probably talk to many people. I told a friend of mine who's again a very big name in African American literature, Charles Johnson, that is there any possibility that we could, uh, I and my wife could just come and meet August Wilson? And he won't believe. And this is again, you know, the chance does play its role. And uh, it wasn't even a week 
when I got a call from Charles Johnson, and he said that uh, you'll be happy to know that August Wilson has invited you both to dinner at Capitol Hill today. <laughs> we went, I'd read uh, quite a good deal about him, and then we got into talking. I didn't, uh, I thought since it was, we were his guests at dinner, I should not <clears throat> start uh, asking him a question in the form of an interview, but I asked him that August, that you are a great name today. What actually inspired you to come to writing? And August said that I was very fond of reading. I had a library card when I was four year old. And I started going to a library at the age of six. But then he recounted a story. He said, I was 14 year old and I was studying in school. We were given an assignment in school where we were asked to write on any character of history who probably influenced the students. He said, I wrote my piece on Napoleon Bonaparte. And after three days, we submitted that essay. After reading that essay, because August Wilson is African-American, though he looks white, the teacher called him and asked him in front of the whole class, you have to tell me who has written this essay for you. August said, it was my essay. I have cited <coughs> all the references there. And you can check on anything. You ask me anything and I will respond to that. And you know ultimately what happened. The teacher said, if you accept that you have, this essay has been written by your sister or anyone else or for that matter, I'll give you an A grade. But if you refuse to accept, I'll give you a D grade. August said, as a 14 year old, I was thinking of all the dreams my mother had for me because his father had left him when he was just six year old. And it was uh, his mother who brought him up. And he said that when I was given the chance to think it over, I simply took the papers from my teacher's hand, tore them up, threw it into the waste paper basket and walked out of the school. And my education ended when I was just approaching 15, he says, but I knew my mother, mom, mother would be sad because she wanted to see me as a great lawyer fighting for the rights of African Americans. But I couldn't do anything about it. But from that day, for the entire duration of the school that I was supposed to be in, I would go to the Dale Carnegie Public Library and read till the library closed. And where Patiala is concerned, I have a monograph in the University of Patiala on August Wilson on his piano lesson, and uh, that is there. So August, when I talk of August, and you know what he said, I said, your mother must be feeling very sad that you left the school. He said, yes, for a little while she was sad, but then she got used to that idea. And today I simply wish my mother would be alive to see that her son August has got 24 honorary doctorates from universities all over the US and Europe, including one from Paul. This is what literature can do. Now, the example that I'm going to give you, probably, according to me, in the context of today's this thing is highly relevant. 
In Bombay, I'm going back again to one century. On the Lamington Road, there is a popular book depot. There was a popular book depot, which was established in 1924. The owner of that book was Ganesh Ramarao Patkar. And he would see that a student would come to his shop with great difficulty, take out some annals. There was, that was the currency then and buy one book and just stand there and stare at the rest of the book. This Ram, Ganesh Ramarao Bhatkal saw that this boy somehow had, an, had a passion for seeing all those books. And he told him that, come in, you can look at any book you like. And he started looking at the books and he said that you can go home only when I close the shop, but listen, before closing the shop, I keep a part of the back door open for uh, routine work to go on. You can stay and read whatever you feel like when you go, when before we finally close. And uh, you know, what happened, the encouragement that he gave to this boy who joined first BA, honors in literature and then did his MA in English literature and you know what this boy states. It was in those years that I read the lines of Wordsworth which have always been etched in my memory. And this, there are three lines from that poem, Tintinabe, lines written, written a few miles above Tintinabe, that is the title of the poem, he quotes three lines and says, that best portion of a good man's life, that best portion of a good man's life is little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. That is the best portion of a good man's life. Little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. And you know, this boy, after completing his MA, he wanted to become an English teacher and Normally, when we see uh, that uh, people don't take to the subject very much, but he was so deeply in love with it, he wanted to become an English teacher. He appeared for an interview. There was another lady who was also an applicant, and she said, oh, uh, and the, the management said, you know, she is elder to you, and she has more experience. So I'm sorry, uh, but we will not be able to offer the job. He says, okay, it's fine. And uh, then he joins the School of Law, in Bombay and then were teachers for some time in Calcutta also. And, you know, you will be amazed to know that this boy was, had a great physical defect. He used to stammer in his young days and he used to feel that he will not be able to do anything in life because naturally the speech becomes important. And his reading of literature, his participating in an elocution contest, poetry recitation, and uh, he became so involved in it that he overcame all these deficiencies. You would like to know who this boy is. I'm talking about Tani Palkiwala, one of the greatest jurists India has known. And C. Raja Gopalachari, who was the first Governor General of India, he said that Palkiwala is God's gift to India. This young boy joins the law profession and one of the greatest 
of the cases that come before the Supreme Court, the, uh, the Keshav Anand Bharati case versus the state of Kerala, which decided the fate of the fundamental rights, it is all that we owe today is to Nani Palkiwala. And you know, in one of the speeches that he made by the Ramarao Bhatkal Foundation, he said that had Ganesh Ramarao Bhatkal been alive today, it would have been an honor for me to touch his feet. So that is Palkiwala. What I'm trying to say is that here you have an example. You had another example. But here is an example of a man who shared through his writings with whatever he learned from his literature. If you read the books written by Nani Palkiwala, you will find that there is hardly any author, any philosopher, right from the Greek to the present time that he was there, that he does not refer to them. And then you see what happens. He was a student of literature, but he joined a profession and he says that I'm grateful that to that lady that is, you know, that because of her, I'm in the profession. And there are judges who said, have, you know, I'm not going to dwell at length because uh, as a student of uh, R.G. Newell, I think every one of you must be familiar with the writings that he has had. And what here I wish to say is that reading literature, because if you are saying something, if that cannot attract the audience, and you know what happened? First, he is to give a budget speech. After every budget, he is to give a speech. This budget speech was first held in a hall, then they became out in the lawns, and then he became such a popular orator that finally the venue had to be shifted to Brebon Stadium because lots of people would assemble there to listen to him. This is the difference that literature can make, your passion for literature can make. Now the question comes, what do we do? Do you go to a university, study BA, MA, and then know what literature is to become great in your profession? No, that would be absurd. I'm going to give you what you need to be aware of. You know, in one of the meetings, an astronomer had said that to an astronomer, man is nothing but a small dot in the infinite universe. Einstein, who was present over there, he observed, I've often felt that, but I then realized that the insignificant dot, who is man, is also the astronaut. And you see, he was such a great scientist. But if you read his writings, you will find that they are profoundly influenced by the, what he did. And he used to say that animals can be trained but only human beings can be educated. Education requires personal participation and transformation. It cannot be given to anyone. It must be inwardly appropriate. And I'll tell you what is very significant is, I just talked about, what do you read? Do you go to a library? If you go to a library, leave alone reading many books. If you just choose one author, you will spend your whole lifetime 
and you will not be able to decipher what you have read. So I'm giving you an example. If you have heard about Shakespeare's play Hamlet, in that play, there is a place where Polonius, and Polonius is known as the fool in Shakespeare. Polonius advises his son before he is leaving for France as to how he should carry out his demeanor, carry out his behavior, what he should do and what he doesn't do. He talks about all those things, neither a borrower nor a lender be and all that. Thing. There's just 26 lines. If you read these 26 lines, you will know what selection can mean. How do you reach those 26 lines? It could be a matter of chance. It could be a matter of uh, the generosity of our teachers, because you know why I hold those 26 lines important today is the world is flooded with millions and millions and millions of books on how to develop your personality, how to succeed in life. You read 400 pages of garbage and uh, you still feel, oh, you know, uh, success to any big data. But if you read the 16 line, the 26 lines, you will realize that in your day-to-day -day experience, how each line can give you a new meaning to what you are trying to achieve in life. But the basic thing is that instead of now, you see what happens in this internet age, there are two parallel sources running together. One gives you a world of information which can be qualified as pure garbage. The other gives you a lot of valuable information, but the information is flooded in such a manner that it cannot be possible for you to retain what you have heard. So rather than that, you have to go to a place where you can see what you need. As I told you in the beginning, that each one must take what he or she needs and appropriate that into your behavior. And I'll tell you one example. You will say that I've been talking about stories and I'm talking uh, about Palkiwala and uh, I've been talking about August Wilson and Frederick Douglass. But how am I sort of related to it? You see, I also went through that phase where my English teacher in the school would say that I feel it is very unfortunate that students like you who love literature so much, they don't come to study literature. I said, uh, well, uh, you know, we have our careers to think about and all that. I remember, and let me tell you, just share this with you, that I have been a student of science who wanted to pursue at the postgraduate level the field of nuclear physics, but my love for literature was so intense. I didn't want to become a teacher, to be very frank. And still, I don't know why I've become a teacher of all things. But the love of the subject that I had, you know, right from when I was in class four, I used to maintain a diary where any, any word, any line that looked to be lovely, I would just note uh, it down in my own handwriting in the diary. And I wouldn't understand many of those things. But later on, as I grew up, I could see, the, you know, what great those words have. So when you talk about the words and words, you never know which can prove heavy. I remember that for uh, standing first in my class, that must have been fifth or sixth, I was given a book as a prize. And that book was King Arthur 
and the knights of the round table. You may have heard or about it, this book or not, but let me tell you one little story in this. It's a great story of the greatness of human beings. And in this story, what, you know, it's something which I read at that point of time, but something which has always kept on reminding me about that part of the story. And you know, in the, the round table, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, it was a table where 150 knights would sit together. And when this was returned to King Arthur by his father-in-law, to whom it was gifted by his own father, he realized that there was a magic in the table. And that magic was that the knight who sat there, if in a particular, on a particular chair, in a particular point of the table, if he deserved that chair, his name would figure in golden letters at the back of the chair. And you know what happened? This is a story. There are so many things in that story that attracted me, but it has taught me no matter how small or big chair we occupy in our professional life, if we must bring credit to that chair by sitting in it, to be worthy of it. And what I feel is that apart from lifelong intellectual curiosity, where you can make books and wisdom of the ages, your lifetime companions, now, when you're choosing, how much should I read? If you are aware of a critic called T.S. Eliot, he mentions in tradition and individual talent that those who strive to attain knowledge, they spend their whole lifetime. But Shakespeare gleamed more of wisdom from the lives of Plutarch than anyone else would have done from the entire library of the British Museum. So what you see, what you take, what you adopt, this is where your own goals are important. And apart from that, let me tell you that when you look at uh, the profession of law, what even if you don't look at, no matter whether you are a judge, whether you are a lawyer or you're working in an office or in a, in a team or battery of lawyers and whatever that is, it, uh, it's really not important. What is important is that literature can give you that feeling of eloquence. When you speak, people listen, which is something absolutely great because Today, nobody listens to what the others are saying because they know that it's most of the time it's not worth listening. But what I wish to emphasize, you know, it is how you learn when you look at the lives of, uh, you know, uh, you read those great books, and Palkiwala himself has said that don't read about the best books, read the best books. And I'll tell you how reading can change your attitude. I'll just refer to one book, you know, Lady Chatelet's Lover. If you Google, you will, first thing you will know that for uh, pornography and other things, it was banned. I was a student out of college. I just joined the teaching profession. I was working or walking down the aisle of uh, the college library, and I saw this book, Lady Chatelet's Lover. And I said, oh, well, uh, this is banned and all that, and it, it seems to be a kind of a, from the cover, it appears that it is probably a stuff which is related to pornography. Anyway, I said, let me, and that I normally do. When I open a book, I see the very first few lines, or I just chance upon and open any page of the book and see if there is worth anything listening or re, uh, taking note of, and I was amazed. And uh, the book begins with, 
Ours is the most essentially a tragic age. So we refuse to take a tragic one. A cataclysm has happened. We are among the ruins. We build up new habitats. We scramble or go around. We have got to live no matter how many skies have fallen. And those lines are etched in my memory. And when I debate, when somebody debates about this, the content of the book, I feel if you are looking for that content, then it could be a work of pornography. But if you are looking at the words, the power of words, the very beginning lines can open a new, entirely new world to you, can teach you perseverance, can teach you how you can resist. And you see what happens. I'll tell you one small incident. And, uh, you know, in Zambia, Lusaka, there is a zoo. And there's a cage in that zoo where there is a notice where it is written the world's most dangerous animal and you know what is there which animal you may not be able to guess inside the cage there is no animal but a mirror where you see yourself so this is what probably can make you change things in life and you know something it is not mainly literature so it is not something which is found in libraries and only that you or you you have to study ba honors or ma literature you can pick up any of these things which could motivate you for life and i wish to share with you and another point before i refer to this is you know what is very significant is that what can change you nobody else can decide what can change you is you yourself but if you can see the dot in the universe which is a human being i think your decision has been made and i as i told you that it could be a piece of anything. It could be a song, it could be a book, it could be a poem, it could be a line in a play. And I remember when I was very young, I was very fond of going, seeing movies and uh, of all kinds. And I remember, I don't remember the name of the film, but I remember the lines where the protagonist says, Jis taraf dil aur dimaag chai, par atma na chai, even animals have that. But Atma, wherever your Atma takes you, take to that world. And as because this is related, basically organized by a law school, I would like to, before I ask Dr. Navreen to switch on the video where I would be sharing a song. I would like to make a share a statement with you by Palkiwala, which all of you as students of law should know. And he says, the survival of our democracy and the unity and integrity of the nation depend upon the realization that constitutional morality is no less essential than constitutional legality constitutional morality and constitutional legality so just think of that and he says dharma lives in the hearts of public men when it dies there no constitution no law no amendment can save it so i wish that someday some of you will achieve the greatness which according to you will give you a lot of satisfaction and say, yes, this particular, I remember, this particular story, this particular line, this particular film, it made so impact upon me that I feel that the dharma that is there in my heart, that has to be protected at all costs. And what it is, it is you to decide. And another thing which I would like to tell you is what 
the French literature can make. There have been famous trials, Joan of Arc and so on, right from uh, Socrates and all that. You may read those trials. That will be a legal document. But try and read something on which some literary genius has written a novel, a poem, a short story, or anything, and see what difference is there in the perspective and perception. That could help you, whether you are a lawyer or a chief justice of Supreme Court, something. And I, uh, some of the books that you should read is George Bernard Shaw, St. John, Gulsworth, the Justice, Upton Sinclair's Boston, which deals with the psychobensity case, Yale Doc Rose, the book of Daniel Rosenberg's trial, the deeds with Joseph Warren, Penn Warren, all the king's men. Now, with these words, before I request uh, Dr. Nublin to ask the technicians to play the song, the song is by Bob Dylan. It's titled Blowing in the Wind, and this is important because it discusses many of the things that I've been talking about. It is one of my favorite songs. So if you have listened to me for such a long time, you can listen to one of my favorite songs too. And uh, I would uh, like to, before I conclude, I would like to say is that the big brothers who have been watching me, I wish to tell them that I don't want merely a cosmetic representation of remarkings in this August event you have organized. And all the students of RGNUL are welcome to write around 300 or 400 words on words and words. But write whatever you feel like, and the best 10 entries we will consider, and the best five entries we will publish in the forthcoming issue of Remarkings. So you see, uh, but this is a, a kind of an invitation. You can take it, and I'll be very happy to see our juvenile and its bright students represented in the pages of Remarkings. And you know why Remarkings is important? Not because your teachers write for that journey, but because the chairman of the Swedish Academy who decides on the Nobel Prize for Literature has also been a contributor to Remarkings. Thank you very much. I would welcome the questions, queries, or whatever it is. Obviously, if uh, the big brothers have not been sleeping through this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Navleen, Dr. Tanya, Dr. Juvenil, Professor Bajpai, and everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we can play the song before I begin with my remarks. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, Indrapreet, sir, you can just play, play the song, please. Thank you so much, sir.
That was a wonderful song. I would now like to invite Dr. Navleen Multani, ma'am, uh, the chair for the session, to deliver some remarks. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, wonderful talk, which has invigorated so many thoughts. I really thank you for the incentive that you have given to our students. You know, I don't know how, sir, you knew about that, that something was going on in my mind, whether we could ever bring uh, our students uh, on the platform of remarkings, but then they have to prove that they are capable of that. Thank you so much, sir, for your invigorating talk and the talk on the epistemological benefits of reading, hearing, listening, uh, to very well structured narratives and that the books have to be our companions for life and there we should have a willingness to learn. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us and our students on the sure. role of education, which has to emancipate our minds. Uh, again, this brings to my mind the words of Martin Hochner, who says that narratives uh, like uh, Professor Prasanshu also made a mention, the word Shabbat se utpati hui, right? So uh, narratives from the ancient epics to the modern novels have changed not only the history, but they have influenced the mindsets of the generations. So, uh, and you very uh, pertinently pointed out that a personal participation is something, you know, which is a prerequisite for us to emancipate ourselves from all sorts of shackles, you know, that we have all kinds of prejudices that we have, because after all, what are these narratives, you know, they are giving an account of experiences, or let me say it conversely, experiences take a narrative form. So life you can never, you know, is, is, is inseparable from the life that can be told. And uh, a French philosopher, Michel Coup, uh, Sartu has rightly pointed out that we are a recited society. And uh, Professor Ghosh has uh, very well begun his uh, talk by telling us what Auden, the great 20th century poet said, poetry can make nothing happen. But yes, in doing so, it is also making so many things happen. Why? Because P.B. Shelley is the one who remarked that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the word. So, sir, has very well, you know, taken us uh, to a very nice journey, a journey which began with Auden, with lots of uh, focus on those parables, uh, the and the story of how a slave gain gaining his freedom by simply reading, and what was. The most interesting part, I think, which everyone would must have appreciated was, though everything is appreciable, sir, August Wilson's and a few of uh, the students, you know, who still have to find a book which they have to work on their project for, can always think of that. And sir has already hinted, they can uh, amply use that uh, secondary resource available in the form of a monogram by Punjabi University, which is on August Wilson. So, um, Whatever life experiences, um, at times, you know, young minds do question why should we listen to the experiences of others? Because it is by listening to the experiences of others, we can bring some kind of changes in our lives. And also, it is a way in which, you know, we can interpret or reinterpret life the way it is told or retold is highly going to shape our reasoning, which is the kind of torch that Sir was referring to when Einstein, you know, was rightly picking up those words that man is a small torch in this infinite universe. So the light is within. We just need to spark that so that whether it's the reading of uh, Wordsworth, Nani Palkiwala, any any writer, whether it's uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, writing, so everywhere you find something or the other which leaves a mark on your life. And uh, really, sir, appreciate your uh, the uh, the one part that you shared about writing of the diary. 
and uh, making a special mention of that banned censored novel, right? Because I, this is something I think many of the students who are into writing or are mesmerized by words, you know, they usually have those diaries and they keep jotting down and it really brings down uh, some memories of our school days as well, you know, when we were uh, noting all these things down and today our students also had to write something and they will be writing. Rather, there was uh, something, so while you were uh, presenting uh, your views, someone in the chat box uh, just wrote that, are we to write on everything, ma'am? So, so it's, it's up to you, uh, whatever, you know, whatever you have been able to grasp properly, whatever you have been able to learn, I think it has been a great learning experience, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your words. And I really want to uh, say that humanities uh, is a great gateway in with which, you know, you can develop your understanding of law and sir's uh, discourse on literature and why literature matters for the students of law, the interdisciplinary study. Again, if you say that this particular book is going to give you a solution to some legal problem is something, you know, which is not intended by this uh, symposium. What we try, the teachers in the Department of English, we are trying to evoke your thoughts, build your understanding, your cognitive skills so that you can assess, make use of it, and then uh, you can, you know, write in a better manner. No doubt, you know, so very uh, rightly pointed out that if you are a good reader and you have uh, assimilated all that literature in yourself, certain words that are etched in your memory, you know, are going to surface whenever you are speaking and that is going to be your hallmark as a good speaker. And as lawyers, you are going to be the wordsmiths. I always keep telling my students and uh, no doubt the writers, the novelists are also wordsmiths. So you have that commonality. There's a common thing that you share. And uh, again, what to say of the song? I think um, it is evergreen and I think it leaves us with so much thoughts more to ponder upon. And I really uh, so appreciate and I'm thankful to you for having invited those um, pa paragraphs from our students. Actually, they actually have to write a paragraph and submit, right? And so that this was, they can build upon it, improve it, maybe they'll get scrutinized and finally uh, a submission to remarkings can be made. And I wish my students also good luck. They can make use of this opportunity. They were looking for a platform to get published. Thank you so much, sir. I am really grateful to you for you presented your views. Thank you so much. Over to you, Nama. Thank you so much, ma'am. If now the floor is open for questions, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. The registered participants will also find a feedback form in the chat box now. And please raise your hand if you have a question. I see there is one raised hand. Please unmute yourself now and you can ask your questions. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Sure. Audible. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful session. You have uh, provided some really wonderful insights that did pique my interest. So my name is Aditi Sadhu and I am from first year. So you mentioned a statement uh, posed by Mr. Palkiwala about uh, constitutional legality and how it should go hand in hand with morality. Now, from what I have seen most of the times, this often becomes a point of tussle between legality and morality, which is mostly our social fabric. So in terms when we uh, talk about issues such as LGBTQ rights or even uh, privacy being granted to live-in relationships. So do you think that law schools nowadays provide a focus on this intersection between legality and morality? And will we be able to learn how to approach such cases when there is a tussle between the two? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's an important question. But uh, morality and legality, legality is something which is, uh, does not need any explanation. What is written in the word of law? 
But when you're making a decision as a judge, I think the morality part is important because, uh, you know, you are trying to anticipate something which is not written. You cannot have, uh, avail that. What you have to, at that point, dwell upon is the spirit of the law and the spirit of the law. I'll give you an example. You know, uh, when I said in, uh, you know, the complexity of uh, judicial uh, jurisprudence and other things, the complexity is that then no matter what you decide, one party is going to be dissatisfied. To that party, it will be injustice. And one party who will win will be justice even if they don't deserve to win. But morality is something where you have to, what we have been talking about all this, Bob Dylan and all that, you can't turn your uh, head permanently and say, I'm not pretending, I'm pretending that I cannot see anything. And I'll give you an example. When uh, Nani Palkiwala was uh, asked to contest the judgment of the central government, you know, nobody would have been, would have dared to go against the government of Indira Gandhi at that stage. But you know what happened? He had taken, uh, he had first, he was first appointed. He was supposed to represent uh, the prime minister. But then he looked at, he questioned himself and he uh, deliberated uh, quite a bit. And on the second day, he returned the briefs to the prime minister's office. And he said that I will fight for the rights of common man because if you if you de uh, demolish, if you make it uh, just these, uh, if you read uh, Palki Wallas, you will find that he just doesn't, he's not scared. He's very humble. He's very polite, but he's not scared. He's very firm. He says that I must defend the fundamental rights of the common man. And he returns a brief and, you know, people from Australia, from Germany, from different parts of Europe, you know, America, they had come to see and Supreme Court used to be very packed when he would uh, forward his arguments. So uh, when you think of the morality part, this morality is, you know, as you, if your uh, duty as a lawyer or a judge is main, mainly to attend a kind of uh, you know, do your job and earn your salary and uh, sort of uh, say that, okay, I've done my job, that is over. No, it's not there. Your duty is your responsibility. First, you are a human being, even if you are a dot in the universe. So what uh, morality is not something written. Morality is come from inside. But what comes from inside of your soul, it, it will only strike a chord when it applies without knowing or knowing that, uh, you know, there are uh, millions who are thinking of this. People used to flock to when lacks to attend his, not because he was talking about the budget, but because he was talking in such eloquence about the common man that you could feel that he was literally touched by the grief of the common man. And if you, one of the greater great things about Palki Wala is not that he has written and he was a great lawyer and all that, but he was a great human being. There are thousands of incidents which will confirm that. So when you talk about the morality part, morality is something which you have to decide, but it must be for the good of all. You cannot say, yeah, you know why Shakespeare is supposed to be great? Because what Shakespeare says, it applies to you, it applies to me, it applies to anyone who's reading him. And you, he can identify. So morality is something which cannot be written, but morality is something which you feel are sort of um, making, if you are a judge or a lawyer and all that, you know, if you say that, oh, uh, morality would mean that who are you to decide there the legality is important but if you are uh, wherever there is a stage i'm not talking about day to day uh, going on in the court because whatever i whatever i have seen with my own eyes inside the court uh, i don't want to share with that uh, you with you all that because it, it is uh, reprehensible absolutely 
but morality if it is there you will not be able to see things which are done in the open otherwise what happens and i'll tell you what i expect the students of law colleges when they go as advocates and all that they may deserve, uh, they may fight the case on behalf of the criminal or the accused i won't say criminal the accused or the defendant or uh, whatever point you are but today you think supreme court gives you all this like pil down the postcard may be chief justice sun leta hai but if you actually go to supreme court you will need to sell yourself 20 times before one advocate says ki ha main case le lunga lekin 6 lakh rupaye mere ek presence ke honge aur 2 lakh mere uske junior ke honge so if you uh, if you are talking about morality i don't say what you do with legal jurisprudence and what the law has taught you but at least you can say that justice must be accessible theek hai koi nahi kar raha main isko free karunga and your uh, you uh, balki wala is a big example in this he ban sil he was one of the very richest of advocates but you know what happens jahan supreme court ka chief justice ye bolega are ye to uska minister hai kal inki sarkar hogi mere ko governor bana diya jayega so that is where morality is coming into question is not coming in is not interfering in that case this is my view and i told you that it is a parable basically you can take it whatever way you but i appreciate the question that's a very important kind of a question thank you sir thank you so much uh, vishal are you there you had a question vishal he actually sir is exploring the relationship between literature and law and has not been able uh, to find much so he just wanted i think after having listened to uh, the discourse that sir delivered i think most of his questions got answered just in case uh, vishal you are there you can unmute yourself and ask your question dr nagreen when it comes to question you know i feel like uh, saying like um, matthew arnold about shakespeare that others abide your question i am free <laughs> right sir thank you so, so when much. i'm uh, normally talking you know i try my best to anti to anti actually sir actually, i think, sir, I think most, most most of most of the queries that students that students have been talking have been answered in the course of time, course of time. Uh, i don't have a question but it's just an observation primarily for the participants and the students i feel that where else like if you start talking about books the kind of space it offers look at the spectrum of what we've covered forensic linguistics in the morning to bob dylan's song in the afternoon i mean where else would you find this kind of space only when you are talking about books stories narratives words and words i think it's been such a beautiful journey from morning to afternoon thank you so thank much for this so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you a lot yes yes thank you so much sir uh, sir uh, professor prasanshu is also here with us sir uh, could we have a few of your observations sir? thank you so much I think the crown should go to the audience because they have been so active, proactive, and innovative with their questions. So it was an overall enjoyable day for me. Thank you. It was a privilege to see your presence here, and I'm I deeply appreciate that. thank you thank you so much sir uh, nama i think uh, we are done with the almost i think sir has dr. not dr. left Nadine. any <laughs> yes sir dr nagreen may i just take a Pardon? minute yes sir sure sir only about sir. about the students uh, participation uh, where it is concerned the writing part i said the uh, 
I mean, the emphasis should be on what the person individually feels about. It cannot, it should not be about uh, putting too much or internet sources or something. What you as an feel, and it can be less. It could be, you need not have to write all those three, 400 words, it could be shorter than that. But whatever you write, you feel that, okay, as a lawyer or a justice or anything. I think I saw a question where somebody probably in some chat has mentioned that, uh, you know, that uh, the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, there has always been that. Why? Because what Gandhi said, you know, there are lawyers who want that these disputes should go on. Because, uh, you know, uh, you uh, see, I've talked about all the uh, great things that you find in uh, literature. But you know, if you have seen Shole, you know, Ghoda Ghaas se yari karega to khayega kya? So, you know, that is the, that logic. But if you are, uh, if you, your uh, conscience is there, if you want to do what the Bob Dylan song says, and you're saying they're blowing in the wind, hamare li nahi hai, to jisko mil jai, utha le usko. It's not that. If it touches you, you will ensure that with your intelligence, with your eloquence, with your background as an honest and uh, person of integrity, you will make sure that the distance between, I don't say it's going to vanish, but you can always reduce the distance between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And I, I'm sure, I don't know, it is just an instinct that of all the participants who are there would someday probably vindicate what I'm expecting today. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter because it was a parable. You were supposed to take whatever you feel like it. Thank you once again, especially for Sansu Shah for uh, your presence. I'm really honored and uh, maybe we could discuss all these things in some other on some other time or some other issue and uh, when the markings is published so i'll make sure that you get to see what it is thank you once again thanks a lot all the participants the technicians dr navdeen dr tanya it was wonderful being with you thank you i would like to thank everyone everyone for joining the session today Session. Thank you so session. much for everyone. Thank you so much for everyone. Uh, uh, before, before we leave, there's just one thing that I would like to put as part of record. I think all the students should really be grateful and obliged to Dr. Multani. She's a very driven individual of the department and it was completely her idea. And uh, uh, I really appreciate the effort, ma'am. I'm so glad it could take the shape how you had imagined it, and we've been able to complete it with success. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you so much, so much Dr. Tanya. Dr. Tanya. I think this would not have been possible had we not coordinated, discussed certain things, all the kind of you know difficulties that we were facing, and we are grateful to our vice chancellor because he is the one you know who has moved us and motivated us. And yes, it would not have been possible uh, without your support, sir, uh, Professor Nabir Ghosh, Professor Prasanshu, their readiness uh, to address our students. You know, this time actually uh, we have uh, opened it only to our students with a few guests uh, who had requested we allowed them and they, they are also attending uh, the symposium today. And in fact, you know, the next one that we have on 9th of October, we uh, plan to open it for all. So the already the flyer is there on the website. It has been shared on the social uh, sites also. I think I shared it with uh, Professor Prasanshu uh, and I will be sharing with Professor Prasanshu and Nibir Ghosh as well. Uh, we'll have uh, um, the justice officer from uh, judicial officer from Sri Lanka, Chanima Vijaybandra for this. So this was sir, a long cherished dream. Both the teachers English department had been dreaming that one day language, law and literature, but uh, again, uh, this would not have been possible without your consent, having accepted our invitation. And yes, the willingness of our participants who get a bonus today that they get an opportunity to publish. The trio Nama, Pranit 
and raghav it would not have been possible you know when they had some questions we uh, we have never met sir we have not met because of uh, the covid the online classes so this was all happening uh, online and we managed everything whatsoever with the great support of it mr indrapreet and mr kuldeep we could connect with pranit one day for the practice session things like that and then i really had to tell them dear students the trio had to arrive on the scene for this thing to happen so thank you so much everyone uh, participants thank you for your uh, patience your time and i hope you've been noting down you were listening and sir has made himself very clear that you need to express your own self in your own words right when you're sending that to yes uh, definitely sir will share the mail that will be forwarded to you wherever you have to send your entries it will be scrutinized by the remarkings board for publication and i think uh, uh, it uh, it can we have uh, mr indrapreet and mr kuldeep say, uh, kuldeep also on the scene please because we want to thank you that it, this has been possible because of you thank you so much thank you so much thanks from my side too Oh yes, right. sir. They really worked on that song. We 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 had because, to play it. Uh, on account of this technicality, you know, sometimes the real problems can arise, and it was absolutely smooth. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. I again thank you on behalf of the Department of English. Uh, wish you all good luck, and uh, we are really honored, sir, to host you, Professor Prasanchu and Professor Nabeel Ghosh. Thank you so much. And right, thank sir. you, uh, ma'am. Chandima has joined us, ma'am. Would you like to share share uh, your views, uh, please? Go ahead. Um, it, it was a very inspirational session, and I'm really uh, happy to have participated. And Professor Dabli, I'm really grateful to you for this kind invitation and making me a part of this uh, amazing symposium. And I'm looking forward to meet you all again uh, in the next session in October. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Janima, ma'am, for having joined us. Uh, you made our day, and we look forward uh, to your discourse on the purple patches in judgments on 9th of October. So it's an invite to everyone, sir, uh, Professor Nabeer Ghosh and Professor Prasanshu, uh, that she will be here with us on 9th of October uh, for another session, which is uh, law and literature, the literary citations in judgments. Thank you so much. We sign off for today. But Nama, uh, Pranit, and Raghav uh, and IT, we can have one more picture with you also in the frame, please, sir. Right? You okay. are the men okay. behind the show. So we want you to be in that picture. We can take pictures and then uh, we can say a bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Well, just one more. Okay, done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.